This is gonna be a long video, but I feel like a lot needed to be said. But overall, I enjoy Dark Winds. Please watch the whole video. However, I don't quite address the use of Navajo language in this review because I, I went on a long rant and then I realized that this requires its own dedicated video because not only is it me discussing the nuances of the Navajo language with these actors and the casting and marketability and stuff like that, but it's like, it's also a reflection of the industry and where we're at now. But just know that like, you know, there were issues and critiques about the Navajo language, but that's gonna be its own video down the road, hopefully the next one, where I just dive into that and have some more research backed stuff to give you guys some context. But please watch the rest of this video. It's very informative uh, if you're curious about a Navajo's thoughts on Dark Winds. Hey everybody, so uh, Dark Winds. Uh, <laughs> I have a lot to talk about, so uh, let's go ahead and just get started. Spoilers ahead. So if you don't know what Dark Winds is about, it is an AMC series based off of Tony Hillerman's novels, kind of an amalgamation, but most particularly the Listening Woman novel that he came out with and Tony Hillerman he was an author way back in the day and he really kind of built his career around mystery novels on and near the Navajo reservation so this show is a dramatization of course of two characters in particular that are from this book series of Joe Leaphorn and Jim Chi Joe Leaphorn, played by Zon McLaren, and Jim Chi, played by Kiowa Gordon. And then we also have Bernadette Toledo, played by Jessica Matt. And all three of these actors did a really good job at acting. <laughs> They're, uh, especially Zon McLaren. Zon McLaren, his acting was really strong in this one. Like I've seen him in some very powerful stuff like in Westworld and Into the West and stuff like that. But here he really has a chance to just shine because I think this is actually the first, one of the very first like large budget things where he is the principal character, where he is the star per se. Kaiwa Gordon as Jim Chi was actually very interesting as well. Kaiwa Gordon as the character, I think he really delivered on Jim being a bit elusive and secretive and stuff like that, but also still wanting to know more or wanting to be closer to his heritage and stuff like that. Now, I mentioned this before in my re initial reaction to the trailer, but like I speculated they were gonna play around with the portrayal of Jim Chi and Joe Leaphorn, and I was right. Traditionally in the books, you know, Joe Leaphorn is kind of a city native, <laughs> an urban native. He has like a college education and he is a little, he's less superstitious and less traditional. He's very secular, if that makes sense. He's a lot more westernized. He's a skeptic, right? And Jim Chi is a lot more, like he is the res boy. He is born and raised on the res, you know, speaks the language fluently, knows the traditions. And I think, I think he's like, if I remember, he actually is like training to be a medicine man on top of being a cop at the same time. And so he is very in tune spiritually and sees things that Jolie Porn doesn't. And that's what kind of makes them a really good pair. A lot like <laughs> Naru and Tabe in Prey, you know, in, in that way. Uh, kind of X-Files-ish too, right? But I really enjoyed the characterization of Jolie Porn as the one being on the res and everything. A lot more grounded and closer to the people. Although they do mention that he did uh, have a master's thesis and everything. So he is a very educated person. but. It looks like he, you know, decided to go back to the res and, you know, start building a life for himself on the reservation and being closer traditionally and stuff like that. Meanwhile, on the other hand, Jim Chi is kind of the outsider, kind of the city native type. He rides around in an El Camino, <laughs> you know, and comes in with a suit and everything. So he, he he's very disconnected from his heritages as well. Spoiler ahead, you know, he's an FBI agent. But that I thought was a very interesting twist actually that like, you know, he came undercover from the FBI as a tribal police officer. It kind of reminded me of Thunderheart in the sense that like in Thunderheart, he's like, what's my cover? And he's like, you're going in there as who you are. An American Indian federal officer. 
So, but I thought that that characterization was a good twist on the original characters. I wasn't bothered by it at all. I, maybe some, you know, Tony Hillerman purists were a little irked by that, but I, I didn't really care. I thought it was much more interesting to me personally. So there's that. A couple other notable performances were by Jessica Matt, and she did a pretty good job as Bernadette. Her character felt a little stuck up, but like, it's just how her character was written. She was stubborn, but she kind of opened up a little and stuff like that. But I was kind of expecting a character like her to be a little annoying, kind of being like this third person in like the traditional Chi and Lee Porn duo, but she wasn't like that. She actually contributed a lot. And to kind of jump in again here, uh, upon rewatching the series, uh, I realized that like <laughs> my initial reaction to Jessica Matten as Bernadette was a little shallow and I watched it again and I realized that like she, I guess I paid more attention to her backstory and I realized that like, no, she actually she has some history, she has some damage, which leads her to be like the way she is. And she is skeptical and for good reason. So yeah, upon second viewing and then looking at what I said, I was like, eh, I don't think I was very fair. <laughs> uh, the other performance is by Diana Allison, who plays uh, Joe's wife. And holy crap, she did a very good job as well. Uh, she is Navajo. She grew up in Farmington, uh, close to where, where I grew up. And so she delivered, she did a very good job. She was so empathetic and sympathetic. And she, she like her and Zan McLaren together, like totally believable as a couple. Like I really enjoyed any time they were both on screen. Like I really enjoyed their time together. And then obviously we have um, Elva Guerra and we recognize her more from Reservation Dogs. We kind of follow her throughout and everything. She did a really good job, like, you know, in her in her performance very held back and reserved i don't know but she, it was just different as opposed to like her character and reservation dogs and the other one is jeremiah bitsui who plays uh husky and jeremiah um a lot of you may recognize him from breaking bad he is gus's right hand man up until you know that one episode uh he did a really good job as husky he was a very interesting villain you can call him he he brought some weight to his character which i really appreciated he really stuck out he also is navajo and i don't know i i, I could tell that he was giving his character a little more credit which i thought was interesting in the world of sympathetic villains uh he actually did a good job he reminded me a bit of eric killmonger in black panther in a sense idealistically and also in the performance. Unfortunately, direction wise, it was pretty obvious from the beginning that like this guy's shady, right? <laughs> but uh, otherwise, like other than that though, his his performance alone was actually really good. And then the other person who stuck out to me was Ryan Begay, who plays, I think he's Joe's brother-in-law, the father of the girl who gets killed at the beginning. He actually was very good. So, uh, he surprised me, obviously Navajo as well. And his performance a couple times really kind of got to me. And I was like, oh, wow, he like, this guy is really good. <laughs> uh, so props to him. And then like for me again, the other one was um, Eugene Brave Rock. A lot of you may recognize him from Wonder Woman. He is in the little, the little group that she's in. And he plays uh, kind of husky's uh sidekick guy he plays a menacing character very well but overall the performances in the show were good they were decent there wasn't anything really awkward about performances a couple times yeah but i would argue that's more in direction and editing but other than that like everyone did great And in the story, I'd say overall, the story is competent. There's some little random little plot holes here and there that I left me a little like, huh? Or are they going to ever go back to that? But like in the end, like you kind of forget about it by the end of it. So it, it was, it was, it was good. It was actually very well paced. The, the momentum of the show actually kind of keeps you going forward. And like, I don't know what it says about me, but I was surprised by that. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, yeah. So let's see what happens in the next episode, right? When it comes to like, I guess, emotional and certain themes and everything too, like this is simply from a writing standpoint and how characters are written, not necessarily a portrayal or an acting thing. But like, I guess I felt more sympathetic and more rooting more for Joe Leaphorn than anyone else in this show. I unfortunately didn't care too much for Jim Chi, but like, I feel like that's something that might be reserved for the second season. But like, it, it, I don't think it was anything Kyle Gordon's. I think it was just how he was 
kind of portrayed because he also had a mission to do, right? But Joe, he is our protagonist. That's what I'm feeling here. Joe Lee Porn is kind of our central character here. And a lot of the heart and emotion is centered around him and his family. The whole thing surrounding his, his son's death, his squabbles with his wife and then his in-laws and everything. Like, I just felt like all of that had so much heart to it. He has a little emotional moment, like a, like a fight, but also like a sad fight with his wife about their son. That, that, how that part hit me pretty hard. Like I was like, okay, like this, I can feel this. This is, this is great. And also when they're having Jim over for dinner and he accidentally calls Jim his son's name, like that moments like that, I thought were really good. And so the heart that the, for me, that's where the heart of the story was. And then the rest was just kind of just the mystery on top. I guess for me, that that's kind of the one thing that I was a little bothered by was kind of the heart of the story, but then the mystery didn't quite connect at all very much. Like, again, it was just me going back to, to, to the plot hole thing, but like the whole thing about him finding this helicopter and also solving the death of his niece, well, they try to make it connect and it kind of does, but very loosely, you know, it's only connected by one person. So like, other than that, like it didn't, the, the emotional weight felt like a whole nother subplot as opposed to the overall story. And that kind of bothered me a little because like the ending happens, you know, they kind of cover up everything, but for the sake of, you know, everyone's safety and whatnot, it kind of felt like, okay, where's the emotional catharsis here? You know, Husky reveals that he is the father of the the, the baby of that one, the one girl. We learn his motivations, right? Like, you know, he he's a he's like he's like Killmonger, where he had these motivations to help his people and everything. He goes about it the wrong way, but like, none of that really connected to Joe's family. It didn't really connect to Jim at all. It didn't really connect to Bernadette at all. They're kind of just characters reacting to a story as opposed to like being part of it, if that makes sense. I don't know, this is kind of the writer in me coming out a little. <laughs> and that's kind of my main gripe, but like, yeah, like it felt like there were two like stories trying to be to connected, but in the end they were more like this, right? Where, you know, Joe and his personal family issues and then his niece's death somehow he you know they try to make it connect to the overall big plot of them trying to uncover you know the robbery of all that money and everything sometimes Tony hillerman's books are like that where he has multiple things happening and then it's revealed how they're all strung together but even in the books sometimes they don't always string together nicely there's plot holes and you're like wait but what about that <laughs> you know and then the other thing too was bernadette and cheese kind of romance it was a little random it wasn't necessary in my opinion maybe it will be the next season but like eh, like it could have survived completely without it <laughs> it uh it didn't feel natural if that makes sense jim it does give jim some motivation to come back in the end and quit the bureau but like other than that like it it could have been a whole nother reason you know and the other thing too was like the fbi agent kind of coming in like re it's revealed literally in the last episode that he is also a part of the heist that was honestly a little okay yeah he's also shady like that's the that's the one thing too a lot of the villains in this show are pretty shady from the get-go so you're kind of like what like okay yeah sure <laughs> but the fbi agent kind of being in on it of the whole thing was a little like a little i don't want to say cliche but a little like eh, okay sure i'm a little more interested in husky i'm a little more interested in like his activism going too far and stuff like that i feel like adding the FBI character may have been, it could have been an issue of like, we don't want to only have native villains. So we need to mix it up a little, you know what I mean? So I'm okay with having, you know, a native villain if the villain is very, I guess, like we understand where they're coming from. Black Panther worked because you know, Killmonger had, his motivations were very real for a lot of people in the real world, right? And Husky's was too, the exact same thing. So, eh, the FBI agent guy being a bad guy could have literally been left out and I don't think it would have done anything different. And then like the ending, the ending was so random. I, <laughs> I did not understand what was happening there at the end. 
Uh, and that kind of leads me into my next little portion here. So there were some uh, interesting filmmaking things that I kind of that kind of took me out. I feel like I have to talk about it because I think it's it's something that was addressed actually in critiques of this of this series. There were some weird choices uh, that like left me a little like it kind of took me out of it a little bit. The one was the visual effects. There are moments where they decided to use green screen and vehicle shots. There were moments where like they used actual in camera shots of like people actually moving in vehicles. The green screening was really random in some places and it was very noticeable for me personally because that's my job. Like I work in post-production, so like I can pick it up easier. <laughs> but that was, that was the one thing I thought was odd. I was like, this is a pretty big budget show and they're going with green screen with this. So that was another thing that kind of took me out of it. And then another one was CGI hair. Uh, there was a scene where uh, the witch lady, she grabs or she has the hair of the trading post's wife the hair was cg for some odd reason i don't understand why i maybe it was because they like really get us to understand that, like this is her hair but like you could have literally really done it with just a huge chunk of hair and it would have been fine i don't know like a lot of weird little decisions like that and then lastly was the editing the editing was jarring at times there's a scene where jim and joe go to the, the catholic church and they're talking to the nun and she answers jim and they cut when she is literally looking this way to say a line. But I could tell that like they had to cut it there, but it's just super obvious. And then like, I don't know, it's just lots of weird little editing decisions that I thought were, that kind of took me out of it. But again, this is coming from me working in that, in that sector. So like I noticed those more, you know, so I don't, maybe other people didn't notice it. But other things that I thought were good was like the cinematography was pretty decent, you know, like I thought, Coloring could have been different, but I'm being really nitpicky here. But overall, like I felt like other than via like visual effects that were, you know, a little TV-ish, like I felt like overall it was okay. And if you noticed by now, I'm kind of referring to critiques and these critiques will be found in the description below. But these are also a lot of my original thoughts as well. Before we do all that though, we need to talk about Tony Hillerman. Tony Hillerman as a person. <laughs> uh, so if you don't know, Tony Hillerman, non-Navajo author. Uh, I think some people were actually surprised by that. Yes, he was a white man based in Santa Fe after a while once his career kicked off. And pretty much the majority of all of his books are mystery series with his main characters being Joe Lee Porn and Jim Chi. For the longest time, it was just Joe Lee Porn and then Jim Chi came in later. So Tony Hillerman, he, uh, <laughs> he's an interesting character in retrospect, I guess now, you know, in the 21st century, 2022, like looking back on the things he said and the things he's, he's done, it's, you know, it becomes a little harder to like him. <laughs> I will give him credit for giving a platform for people to look a little bit deeper into Navajo life, having Navajo characters. None of his protagonists are white. They're all Navajo or like they're native at least, right? And he also strayed away from making Navajo life seem, you know, kind of like that poverty porn, so people call it, kind of like, you know, showcasing how miserable we as a people are. He kind of went the other way <laughs> and leaning a lot into Navajo mysticism and Navajo culture and supernatural elements of Navajo belief systems and stuff like that. And that's for me the part that's a little problematic Actually, it's very problematic in the sense that like he got the trust of so many Navajo elders to kind of feed him some information about some very sacred elements of Navajo culture. And he uses that in his novels to kind of propel the story, to propel the mystery. The issue with that is it a lot of times exoticizes and idealizes Navajo way of life and Navajo people kind of makes us not in control of our own stories and control of our own culture. Everyone felt back then that like, again, going back to my native receptions of native representations video, back then it was like any representation, any positive representation of natives will take it. And that was kind of where everyone was coming from at the time. Now we are way, we are leaning more into a post-colonial society where people are becoming a lot more critical of stuff like this now and rightfully so and tony hillerman's world of the navajo is coming from him 
It's a very idealistic, it's a very mysticized, exoticized view of Navajo life, culture, and people. And I'm being very frank with that, <laughs> you know, and he, he has said things that were bad. Uh, he said that like, hell, I know more about Navajo culture than some Navajos do. The audacity. <laughs> <laughs> okay, man, like calm down, you know, and you know, frankly, yeah, he uses an entire culture, its values, its beliefs, leans on that for his living. Discussing Tony Hillerman as a person is kind of a thing. And again, there is a book about his life and everything. Uh, I think his daughter is now in control of his estate. But like, that's just from me as a Navajo person, especially a young Navajo person, that's just kind of how I see it. And of course, you know, it's not that he meant ill will towards Navajo people, but it's the simple fact that like he profited off of pretty much exoticizing and often a lot of cases misappropriating Navajo culture, way of life and everything. <clears throat> but anyways, again, the show really does its best to try to kind of lean away a bit from his idealized version of Navajo life, uh, especially having some Navajo writers kind of it helped a little bit. And there were certain things shown on screen that were that are pretty typical Navajo practices, uh, but in the show they aren't necessarily explained. They're kind of just shown. And in my opinion, that kind of is a good thing. To the general audience, they might be curious, but I, as a Navajo person, I feel like going too deep into explanation of things goes into that territory where you are kind of corrupting the sacred. This is a whole nother topic that kind of leans into how art and film in particular can portray the sacred. And it's and not just for native sacred events, but pretty much any religion. And if you look at it from a theoretical standpoint of how you portray the sacred, it has to be done with a lot of nuance, right? And when it comes to native belief systems and things that are held sacred by a lot of tribes. This show, in my opinion, it went back and forth with it. There are certain things that were like very vague and they suggested, and I, I give them credit for, in my opinion, I'm, I am believing and trusting that they did it for the sake of like not going too deep into it and because you don't need to know because it's a sacred thing, but we just showed it. Uh, I'm, I'm, ta I'm talking about specifically the ash stuff and the uh, the token thing. I personally am not gonna go too deep into it for proving that very point, that these are things that are kind of just known in Navajo culture. You have to be, in some cases, initiated into certain spiritual circles to understand these things. And so I, it's, it's very, eh, it's back and forth, right? But again, you also gotta remember that we're also, this show is also making this for a mass audience across the world to be on a large freaking, streaming platform on the same level as The Walking Dead, right? So it's hard, you gotta really, like I, you know, the critiques come in, yes, and I agree with those critiques, but at the same time, you gotta give the writers credit for finding a way to be able to try to portray these cultural nuances in a way that is, isn't is trampling, but yet respectful, but gives enough so that the audience can understand, especially a non-Navajo audience. But there is one thing that I will kind of dig deep into that I didn't, quite like was the supernatural elements. I would say the supernaturalness of Tony Hillerman's books and in this show in particular is kind of the number one selling point, marketable thing about this series, both in book and TV show. Unfortunately, that is the thing that kind of people are like, kind of like interested in watching, right? So, <laughs> The supernatural elements in this show, I guess I was bothered because they were literal. They, they were real. Uh, we have the witch lady. She kept, she like works for the Buffalo Society and she curses people, right? She collects people's hair and everything. She has a skin hanging up in her living room collecting fat and juices. And I guess for me, it's like in the books, Tony Hillerman goes about of suggesting the supernatural. A supernatural is either proven to be like false the entire time, kind of Sherlock Holmesy, where they're like, like, oh, so this is what actually happened, and blah blah blah, or he leaves it really open for you to decide whether or not, like, huh, okay, so maybe it did happen this way, maybe somebody was cursed, you know what I mean? But the show goes out of its way to be very literal. Again, should go into that scene where she puts the hair into the earth, curses that woman 
She gets bit by a black widow, goes into a coma. Like it's super, super literal, right? I have no issue of showing that like the supernatural among the Navajo is a very real thing for Navajo people. I'm a huge advocate for that. But it kind of leaned into it to the point that like it didn't matter for the story. The supernatural elements for the overall plot did not serve a purpose <laughs> at all. It just didn't. Like you could have literally took the witch lady out of it and it wouldn't have made much of a difference. The the origin of the crime of like the, the heist, because it seems like the heist is kind of the main thing that they're, we're looking at. The supernatural stuff doesn't really account for that at all. It only does for the death of Joe's niece. And even then, that death is very loosely, I would say it was kind of forced into trying to fit to the overall plot. That's just me though. But like for some people thought it was really scary because it was a little too like, ooh, you know, because like, again, it's suggested that she is a witch and Navajo witches are the skinwalkers. I'm gonna be very careful about how I talk about this if you're Navajo. But skinwalkers in general have been grossly misappropriated and misrepresented in popular culture overall. But unfortunately, because of that, they're very exoticized. They're a fun cryptid. I talked a bit about this in my, or my Natives in Horror video series. <laughs> I would argue if you're looking for representation of skinwalkers, this series probably has the most accurate one hands down. <laughs> And it's annoying because it literally has nothing to do with the story, right? And they make it to be a very real thing, blah, blah, blah. It's really annoying. Now, when I say, when, when the reason, again, the reason I'm a little mad or a little frustrated is that, that the supernatural elements were literal is because, again, it kind of takes away from the main story and it kind of makes it, it really leans into the pop culture-iness of like, ooh, she's a witch. Ooh, there's a skin and uh, Bernadette like falls into the skin and then it kind of does this weird thing and it's like hinting, you know, it's like, it's really giving non-native audiences what they want in my opinion. Maybe some Navajo people thought it was fun, but at the same time I thought it was like, eh, like this whole thing could have literally been a completely different show. It could have been a completely different thing. It didn't really need to be in this show in particular. Again, I'm not dismissing that supernatural, the supernaturalness of Navajo life isn't real. For a lot of people it is, but I felt like the use of it in the show in particular, how it was used was just no, it didn't really need to happen or exist. I think it was just there simply to, you know, be fun or have a sense of like, ooh, to it. The character uh, Bernadette gets witched, right? And everything. And I think, you know, it can appeal to some people on the res who have experienced that type of stuff. But like at the same time, it just didn't serve the story it didn't, at all. <laughs> and I'd argue there's some Navajos who are like, ah, like, no, I don't want to see this. <laughs> there's, a, there's been a few critiques too that like the show kind of poses a bit of like, again, like an idealistic view of Navajo life from a showy perspective, right? I feel like that's just gonna happen no matter what. Reservation dogs, they're able to get away with it because they're showing life as it is now. But this is the thing about 1970s Navajo Nation life is that there already is a sense of nostalgia on the res right now associated with that era. And so I think a lot of people kind of look fondly in that era and it's a mixture of production design kind of leaning a little too into it and just how the show is wanting to kind of make Navajo life this way. Like there's a scene where, you know, Joe is in Gallup. <laughs> it doesn't look like Gallup, right? It looks like downtown Santa Fe. That's really what it looks like. And he picks up a blanket, but it's like a Pendleton, you know? And I was like, I don't think Joe would buy a Pendleton blanket. I think he would buy a woven rug by a real Navajo artist. You know what I mean? It's just stuff like that that was a little like, eh. But at the same time, like it's what you get with a show like this, you know? And these critiques are valid. These critiques, I agree with them. And my critiques, I think are valid too. And to jump in again, one of the main reasons why Reservation Dogs and Rutherford Falls managed to do well is because they were they were able to focus on character and the story. With Dark Winds, I, I had a feeling that they were having a hard time juggling culture and story as well overall. Reservation Dogs and Rutherford Falls, they aren't bound to the language. That's another thing to consider. Uh, but with this show, the language plays a huge role of the Navajo people. Like our language is is held in high regard. I mean, it helped 
win the Second World War. The language is very much intertwined with the culture and the people. And so that's another thing you have to consider of like the difficulties with this show in particular, incorporating language and culture. And I'm curious to see how Echo is gonna do it, Disney Plus's Echo series. I wonder if Echo, her character, if her character is of a specific tribe and if they're gonna lead into that or if it's gonna be kind of like Rutherford Falls where her tribe is kind of basically made up for the sake of the story, but still respectful. So, but when it comes, basically what it boils down to, we need, we need more Navajo talent. If we are gonna get something of this caliber, if we're gonna be as authentic as we possibly can, right? I'm actually excited for season two. Chris Iyer did mention that um, they're gonna take those critiques and analyze them and see what can be done. I know they hired another showrunner. He did Hells on Wheels, which is also, was also done by AMC. I'm curious to see if we're gonna get deeper character stuff with like Jim Chi. We're gonna look more into his past, you know, because this first season, again, was very focused on Joe. It kind of had like a, it, it kind of had like a No Way Home ending where Tom Holland Spider-Man, like at the, by the end of that film, he is the Spider-Man that we're all familiar with. And this one felt like that with Jim Chi, where Jim Chi comes in at the very end and he is, this is like the origin of the Jim Chi that we're used to in the books, right? Overall, the show, let's see, 3.5 to a four. That's what I give it out of five stars. A letter grading, I would give it a, let's do B to B plus. That's what I'll do. <laughs> I don't wanna sound like I was disappointed. I definitely wasn't. And this show is important for the same reasons that Reservation Dogs and Rutherford Falls are important because we're kind of singling out a specific tribe here. But what I do appreciate is that it really does a good job of trying to steer away from, like I mentioned earlier, that whole poor people native thing. Again, like I mentioned, it kind of goes the opposite and kind of idealizing us. But I'd rather have a mixture of both. Like I'd rather Rather, like Reservation Dogs does a really good job of not idealizing, but also not leaning too far into the socioeconomic conditions of people on the reservation either. It just allows these characters to breathe and live in their own world, right? And so Dark Winds, I believe like through, through the cast and the acting, the direction of, of acting, like that did that very well. But I guess for me, it's more about the specifics of like, <laughs> Uh, production design and the use of Navajo and then the use of kind of specific cultural elements like I mentioned earlier so but like again I want to stress as a Navajo I am glad that the show exists I am happy I am very happy <laughs> that like something like this has happened it's an important step in the right direction towards you know the representation of not only Navajo people but just indigenous peoples overall. But again, I don't want to seem like that I'm like disappointed or anything or that I'm like ripping into it. That's not how I'm going about it. I believe that criticisms, you know, reviews and stuff like that, I think they serve a purpose to analyze why a certain thing works or doesn't work so that it can be improved upon. In my opinion, that's the purpose of like a movie critic is to, you know, look at this film, figure out what went wrong or what went really right. It also helps with marketing if there's good reviews, right? But like, I think a genuine critic of a certain art has in mind, like, I love this thing. I want to love it more. And I want to bring to light and break it down and figure out how we can best make it better. That's kind of the goal here with my review of the show is to kind of break it down in certain ways or analyze things that like, that I know for a fact can be improved upon. I'm gonna stop talking. I can't wait to finish doing stuff for Reservation Dogs and then Rutherford Falls, I'm gonna do kind of like an overall show review and my thoughts on it um, because the second season, after the second season, unfortunately it was canceled. And then after this, I also have a little tidbits of video essays. I wanna talk about other topics that don't have to do with shows happening now, but they're just more, you know, pop culture theoretic stuff, so. Thanks guys. You guys, uh, we're just, we're over 5,000 subs now, which is a lot. <laughs> I want to thank all of you. Uh, I was able to upgrade my microphone. So stuff like that. It's just, it helps a lot. And again, follow me on social media. I'm trying to be better at social media. It's so hard to be on social media. 
I like this because I can just kind of throw it all out there at, at once to y'all and everything. So there are other shows that I want to check out and, and discuss as well. Uh, Outer Range is one I want to take a look at. Fargo, 1883. There's all these shows that have native representation trickle throughout. Resident Alien, they all have that. And I guess I need to find some time to kind of sit back and kind of take a look at like, you know, what they're doing. But the reason I'm focused on these shows is because they have native leads, they have native writers. I'm more invested in these right now. So there you go. Thanks for watching guys. I'll see you guys in the next one. Be sure to follow me and everything and I'll talk to you guys later.